Snatched from Mother Africa's womb, placed in a floating tomb, the slave cried out from perdition, how can I pray in this condition? And that's a poem that I wrote many years ago when I was reflecting on how the enslaved Africans who came across on the Middle Passage, you know, as Muslims we try to engage in levels of cleanliness and imagine spending days lying in your own waste and wrote the poem called how can i pray in this condition and so we have to recognize that the the people who were in captivity they weren't slaves they were enslaved people it's just like if slavery was reinstituted today we would um bring certain skills. We would bring medical professionals, we would bring um, IT professionals, we would bring counseling professionals, we would bring um, laborers and, and all sorts of people. So again, we have to look at it and start having a, a paradigm shift that these were people who were enslaved, they were not slaves. And some of the tribes that were represented were from the Akan, the Yoruba, the, the Igbo, the, the Mandinka, and also the Wolof, uh, the, the Fulani, and the, and the Bundi, and the Shamba, and the U and the Ga, and the Ibobu people. And again, it, it, impact, it impacted everyone on many different levels. And when Islam ri arrived, or many of the people who came to, um, to, to, to this country, they recognized that the fact that they had many cultural traditions and so Islam was one of the cultural traditions. Some of the scholars say that the enslaved people, some, they were 10 to 30% Muslim. You know, some say 10% on the low end, 30% on the high end. And so there were many people who continued to try to practice Islam even while they were, you know, enslaved. Some of the names that we remember or we recall, Omar Ibn Sayyid, Abdul Rahman, Ayub Suleiman, Bilali Muhammad, and in fact, Bilali Muhammad, they, they, there's a, a manuscript in the University of Georgia written in Arabic that he put, put together, and it's based on, you know, again, traditional Islamic scholarship. So you had Muslim scholars enslaved, and it is always, it is also said that many of us who are of African descent, and, my, and again, my family came here on the Middle Passage in the 1700s. And again, you had Yoruba on one side, and you had, you know, the, the Mandika on the other side. And so many of them were mu largely Muslim tribes. And so it is said that the Muslims who are of African descent are the answers to the prayers of the enslaved people of the past. And of course, Bilali Muhammad, he again practiced Islam in captivity. And then even, um, you, 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 if you're familiar with Sapelo Island, he was there on Sapelo Island. And in fact, there's a Muslim graveyard there that exists to this day. And if you look in the book uh, from the Senegalese scholar Sylvain Diop, again, it's a Mus African Muslims among American slaves. She, she basically documents the, the number of slaves who were in captivity uh, in, in, the, in the United States. Again, and there were also many families that continued to practice Islam while they were enslaved and then even after slavery. But there was also forced conversions, forced conversions, and at one point, some of the enslavers basically stated that we have to stop bringing Muslim slaves over to the continent because they have a firm belief, of, of, and it's harder for them to basically Christianize them. They use that term, Christianize them. In other words, force them into Christianity. And so, you know, we have to understand that a part of the the slave trade or the colonialism, which was the manifestation of uh, it's, in slavery in the Middle Passage was the, colonial, the, the manifestation of colonialism in this part of the world. And so what happened is that they, wanted, they saw Islam was spreading in Africa and that was one of the ways that they tried to break uh, the, the growth of Islam uh, in, on the continent of Africa. And again, after slavery, people tried to basically come back to Islam or find manifestations of Islam. And we, we're going to mention the, the, the different groups. One of the groups was the Moorish Science Temple, 
founded by um, Noble Drew Ali, and of course, um, the Nation of Islam, one of the founders, he was Farid Muhammad, but one of his main students was Elijah Muhammad. And, and so he was a part of the, the Moore Science Temple for a minute, and also the, one of the great students of Elijah Muhammad was El Haj Malik Shabazz, Malcolm X. His father was also a part of what's a group called the UNIA, the Universal Negro Improvement Association, founded by Marcus Garvey. Why do we mention, again, the Universal Improvement Association? The, one of the main mentors of Marcus Garvey was a man named Dusay Muhammad Ali. And he was a Sudanese uh, um, Egyptian Muslim scholar. And, he, and if you look at the, 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 the theme for the Universal Negro Improvement Association, it was one God, one destiny. One God, one destiny. And so then after that, you had different groups, variations of, um, of different groups. Uh, there was the, the Ahmadiyya did a lot of work in the African American community. And you had a, a group um, led by a gentleman, by, by his name was Sheikh Azazadeen. And he was a part of the Moore Science Temple. And then he was out of New Jersey, in fact. In fact, if you look at the group, the Bureau of Indigenous Muslim Affairs, they are direct descendants from the, the movement started by uh, Sheikh Azazadeen. He basically traveled to Egypt to learn traditional Islam. And then he came back, and they had a, a major conference in Philadelphia. And there's a picture you'll see online, a major conference um, of, of uniting the Muslims in America in 1943. You know, and so as, 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 as um, trying to get across that Islam in the African American community is not a new thing. It didn't start in the 80s and 90s. It started, again, when the first slave came, the first enslaved came over here who said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Because again, they were Muslim scholars. And so we have to look at that, that, that fact and, 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 and know that it is a continuum. And so what we have to understand is that when we look at the, the, the work that El Haj Malik El Shabazz did prior to his coming to Islam, because you have to understand he only practiced Islam, traditional Islam, for about one year. You know, he made the Hajj, and then, uh, you know, alhamdulillah, Allah, you know, gave him the Jihadah prior to him making the Hajj. You know, so it's important that we recognize he was not um, practicing or promoting Islam for the years. I think he joined the Nation of Islam around 1952. He was martyred in 1965. And so he was teaching a variation in what Dr. Sherman Jackson calls a heterodoxical Islam, basically aspects of Islam being presented. And so they taught something that was basically different from what traditional Islam was. And so once he basically came to Islam, the rest of his short life, he worked to undo the work that he had done. And there's a speech that he gave the week before he was martyred. It was called, it's called The Last Message. And um, it's online, it's available online. He talks about his, his growth in the Nation of Islam to the point that he came to traditional Islam. And so his journey was just one of one journey of, of one man. And, and I always teach that he, um, he still gives dawah from the grave because the book, his book, uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X as told to Alex Haley, uh, you know, uh, he, he basically taught about you know, what Islam was and what Islam wasn't. And from that fact, I've, there's, there's countless people that I've ran into that said that I, once I read that book, I came to Islam. You know, once I read that book, I had a better understanding of Islam. And so we have to recognize, again, even in death, he's, he's given dawah. And so what we have to also look at the fact that there have been other groups. And in fact, when El Haj Malik Al Shabazz came back to um, America from the Hajj, he went to uh, what is now known as the Kuba Institute, and it was Sheikh Nafi, and he used to call them those sheet-wearing Negroes. You know, this is what is the name he used to, to call them, and he had to go back and apologize, you know, to some of the people who were continuously practicing the Sunnah, you know, for many years, and and so they were in direct contradiction to what the Nation of Islam was teaching. So he came back and apologized specifically because he was in Philadelphia as a minister for many years. And so when he came back, you know, he, he, that was one of the things he had to do to try to straighten that out. But I would encourage you to listen to the last message of Malcolm X and then you'll see 
the, the message. And if anybody is confused about his, his message and his mission, give him that speech. And, then, and sh he shuts him down from the grave. And again, if I've said anything that's inconsistent with what Allah would have me say and what the Prophet, peace be upon him, has real modeled for us, I take full responsibility for that. And if I've said anything in which you have gained some new insight on al Haj Malik al Shabazz and the growth of Islam in this country, as always, all praise belongs to Allah. Jazakallah khaira, uh, Imam Nadeem Ali, mashallah. We have a lot of inspiration that we can get from understanding the history and the challenges that the African American Muslim community has faced in this country. Um, one question I'll ask you. Um, you know, as we think about the challenges that um, you know, the African-American Muslim community has faced, um, and we get a lot of inspiration from that, what is one lesson that you would like the audience today to, to take away and actually start practicing in their lives, especially as we see a lot of oppression going, around, going on around us in the world today? What's one lesson that each of us can take away and, and, and try and implement in our lives? You know, there's uh, probably many lessons, but one of the main things we have to recognize that we have been struggling in this country, you know, since inception, since the inception, you know, of this country for the most part. And so in the African-American community, many of us, I came through uh, um, civil rights movement, black nationalism, and pan-Africanism, and to Islam. And so, and that's been in my generation, I'm 69 years old. Uh, when El Haj Malik El Shabazz died, he was, um, I was 10 years old. And when, when they presented it in the media, they, they presented it as if it was a bad person that passed away. Three years later, I had a teacher come uh, into class. She, um, Diane Palm, she lives in Texas, Dallas, Texas now. And I had, to visit, had the opportunity to visit her, you know, again after 30 years. She came in one day and said, I'm tired of all this blank and use some profanity. We, in eighth grade, and, and we just said, um, um, oh, Ms. 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 Palm is mad. And she put on ballots of bullets, one of the speeches of Malcolm. This was science class. She put on ballots of bullets one day. The next day, she put on message to the grassroots. And I always tell people I haven't been the same since. You know, so I was 13 years old at that time. And again, I came to Islam you know, in, in 1978 on my um, 23rd birthday. And so we see Islam as a, a tool for struggle. Uh, one of my teachers, Imam Jamil Alameen, and may Allah preserve him and release him, he uh, basically used to say that we were struggling without a book. We were struggling without a book in the civil rights movement, in the pan-Africanist movement, in the African, um, in, the, in, the, in the black um, struggle movement. But Islam gives us the tools for struggle in the Quran and in the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And so we have to stop practicing Islam as a religion and practice Islam as a deen. And that's one of the lessons I wanted to give. And a deen is a way of life. Religion is just a set of rituals.